Greetings, Audio Avengers. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that means it's time to talk about the second episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Every week, we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from multiple angles you will only find on this podcast. Our story cast is live, and Amanda and Maeve explain how this show challenges the myth of the American cowboy and asks hard questions about who gets to define a person's identity. On Wednesday's Ponder Vision, Jesse Taylor and I are going to dive into the biggest, weirdest, most fascinating questions that we cannot stop thinking about from this episode. We'll get into the power broker, the real definition of wizards, and more. And this is our character cast, where we explore episodes of Marvel TV through the lenses of the characters themselves. We're going to talk about Sam and Bucky's relationship, the most important aspects of their arc in this episode, whether and how much John Walker sucks, and a bit about those pesky flag smashers. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and to help me understand these characters better is a real live defender of the Constitution, Christine Kippens. Hi, Christine. Hey, hon. Is the MCU openly encouraging us to ship Sam and Bucky? I think they are. They have to be, right? Yeah, or at least they're like, listen, um, toxic masculinity, fuck that. Let's not embrace that. Let's actually, you know, embrace closeness and intimacy. Yeah, let's get those knees real close together, pushing in, tighten the crotch of each other, and then just figure some hard truths out together. While staring longingly into one another's eyes. I love it. Well, that's why I wanted to start today by talking about Sam and Bucky's relationship, because it's obviously going to be a central pillar of this show. It's one of the things we've been so excited about. And while last episode, we didn't get a single moment of them together, this episode is almost nothing but that. And I loved it so much. There's so much to talk about here. And the place I want to start with you is, what was your favorite scene with them together? I mean, this might be a bit of a cheat because it was really long, but like all of Munich, I loved Mm. it because it was so lighthearted. This episode was pretty heavy, right? Yeah. So this early scene with the two of them really stands out for me. It was just pure Sam and Bucky without the stakes or the tensions between them being too high. And we get to see them in their element a military operation outside of Munich where they get to jump out of planes and beat up bad guys. And the banter between the two of them is just (laughs) so delightful. I loved when Bucky dropped that his name in Wakanda is White Wolf. Mm -hmm. You know, I enjoyed it when Sam snuck up on Bucky in the warehouse. And of course, I absolutely adored their tumble in the grass at the end of the unsuccessful flight with the Flag Smashers. It was light, (laughs) it was funny. You know, there are a few moments in the scene that later on I plan to go into, you know, some more depth. But in terms of favorite scenes, this takes the number one spot. Within that, I really enjoyed the scouting of the base, right? Because leading up to that, Sam was teasing Bucky with Red Wing, taping his fall and all that. But Sam knew when Bucky was fed up. And when Bucky was fed up, he was just like, okay, let's just do this thing. So he pulled back, which is not something we've always seen these guys do with each other. They were mutually impressed with each other's stealth, which I thought was cool, right? Like, first he was like, ooh, you're the White Panther now. He's like, a White Wolf, actually. But then Sam snuck up on Bucky, and Bucky was like, oh, shit, you know, you're right right there. And there was the gentle teasing, but again, I feel like they knew when to stop. And most importantly to me was watching Bucky listen to Sam, albeit reluctantly. Mm -hmm. Bucky's instinct was just go in, fuck people up, smash it up, hulk out on these dudes. And Sam kept being like, no, we need to learn more about what they're doing and where they're going, which admittedly, once again, Bucky still wound up jumping the gun and ruining. But the point is, Bucky was listening to Sam. They were trying to be a team together. And I just love that so much. Yeah. Yeah, I really did enjoy that. There, I, again, there are certain elements of that scene that I think indicate some problems. Okay. And I don't want to spoil my own responses to some of your questions, but there's so much in that early scene. But yes, it, in particular, the um, the stakeout or the 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 search of the warehouse itself was such a meaty good part of everything that happened in Munich. 
Yeah, it also did hurt Bucky a little when Sam called him an assassin. That did sting. Hello, I will talk about this later on. I agree with you 100% because I'm listening to you be like, Sam, you know, Sam knew when to stop. And I'm like, well, mm, did he? Did right, he? We'll, we'll get to that. Because again, <laughs> listeners, in case you don't know, Christine and I hide all our answers to, from each other so that we can surprise each other with this stuff. So we don't we don't always know where things are going. I thought I was going to have the cool answer by being like, well, I thought the scouting of the base was my favorite scene. <laughs> so, you, 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 you know, but I actually, the truth really is, that the couples therapy was my favorite yeah. scene because of some of the stuff we were just talking about up top. It pushed some boundaries of toxic masculinity. Of course, they were still being a little toxically masculine in the way that mm. they were being uncomfortable, but they still shoved up right with each other. I really enjoyed the details about each of them knowing and liking different aspects of which parts of couples therapy they were aware of, right? Like they each knew a different exercise, the soul gazing thing or the miracles question and all that stuff. I thought those details were really good. And of course, I loved the fact that Bucky had a breakthrough. Yes. And I loved the fact that that hurt Sam and they dealt with that in a non-cheesy way. In other words, it would have been very easy for them to wrap that scene up differently once Bucky has a breakthrough. But instead, it reflects back on Sam in a way that you know, he deals with much more humanly than I guess a lot of writers might have handled that scene. So anyway, I just, I love the couple's therapy. And of course, the doc in that scene too does her job really well. She's there just enough, you know, to sort of tease and, and poke at both of them without realizing it. And then I was unsettled by the end of it, which I'm not exactly sure I understand how far they're going to take it when Bucky turns back to the doctor and, and you know, indicates he's about to go hurt people and that they're, he's about to go break his rules that they had just talked about last episode. So I feel like, I don't know, there's, there's a lot going on in that scene to unpack. And I've rewatched it a couple times, just that part to to think more about these characters. See, I read the end of that scene very differently. Ooh, tell me more. So, um, you know, Bucky has his breakthrough. Sam has his reaction and he leaves. And when Bucky asked the doctor, you know, what's what's step number two again? And you... Bucky's such an asshole sometimes. I like know. he knows, he knows what the fucking three steps are, but he's, you know, this is his his dickish way of communicating, which I, you know, I love. Um, the passive aggressive way in which he's communicating with her. But, you know, when she reiterates that it's, you know, don't don't hurt anyone, I think that's Bucky saying, I just broke rule number two. I just did that with the way I communicated with Sam and he's regretful of it. So, um, you know, when they step out and Sam's like, well, I feel great. And Bucky's like, I feel awful. <laughs> you know, it's him being like, you know, I, listen, therapy is also exhausting, especially when you have a breakthrough, right? Like it's just emotionally taxing. But I think he feels awful because he knows that he hurt Sam. And I'm going to go into this later on with some of my um, responses to some of your questions, Mark. But he's cognizant of the fact that he hurt Sam. And he doesn't like that. He doesn't want to do that to him. Right. Whereas Sam just puts up the wall, slaps him in the arm and walks the F out. And like you said, at right. the end is like, I feel great because, you know, it is what it is. Though, once again, I will point out that Sam takes a beat, listens to Bucky and agrees to the Zemo plan, even though he doesn't love it. So once again, Sam doing some work, doing his best to make this team work, at least at times. Uh, we'll yeah. get into this, some of their mistakes. But all of this talk makes me wonder, do these guys hate each other, or love each other? Are those things even mutually exclusive? Man, no one drives us crazy like the people we love, right? Uh, right, true. So I don't, listen, I don't know if they love each other, I can't even tell you if they're friends, but what is crystal clear is that they are teammates. Yeah. That moment in the Jeep with Walker and Hoskins tells me everything I need to know about how Sam feels about Bucky. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam can tease Bucky until his face turns blue, but he won't let someone else do it. Yeah. Sam went on and on about Bucky and his staring problem. But the second Walker said something about it, Sam told him it was something that he would get used to. Right. That's a great point. Yeah. He could have very easily have piled on. Right. Like and you could see Sam doing it like the way everybody piled on cap with the language comment. Right. But instead, he puts it on Walker to change. Not Bucky. 
even though he acts very differently about Bucky's staring problem when he and Bucky are alone. And as for Bucky, it seems like he hates everyone except Yori. Right. But his therapist flagging that he knows a lot about Sam means Bucky talks a lot about Sam during his sessions. And to me, that says a lot. Bucky knows that Sam believed in Sam. That means a lot to him. And there's no question that Bucky loves Steve, Steve loved Bucky, and the two of them are brothers. And Sam and Bucky seem to have a brotherly relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Just not as amicable (laughs) as childhood friends Steve and Buck. Yeah, that's right. They obviously say they hate each other in Civil War, but it's all it's all played for laughs on screen, at least. And I do right. think you're right, though. There's evidence of these two trying, as you mentioned, Sam protecting, being defensive of Bucky's weird staring habits. Also, Bucky did try to show some kind of sympathy for the loss of Red Wing. Sam does not buy it. Right. But, you know, there's a little moment there. And... They do stick together whenever they're in the face of these other two Captain Americas. At every turn, they have each other's back in those moments. And so that's that's heartening to see. What do you think is the root cause of their tension, though? I mean, my guess is their connection to Steve, right? So friends who share a best friend don't always get along. Right. Um. I mean, thankfully, I've avoided that. All of my best friends love each other. So it's like this great, wonderful group. But I think that each one of them has an insecurity that stems from the other's relationship with Steve. Yeah, You know, Sam got to spend a lot of time with Steve that Bucky couldn't because he had to get his mind right in Wakanda. And then when he gets his mind right, you know, Steve has this new wingman who replaced him. And Sam can't compete with all of Bucky's history with Steve, right? So I feel like there's a competition there. Who does Steve love and respect more? And they'll never know. They'll never know. That's right, because I do think they are jealous and worried at some level that the other one was Steve's true number one, right? Yeah. Well, Sam was there when Bucky wasn't, but then Bucky was there before Sam was ever even alive or like his grandparents might have even ever been alive. So... There's a good reason for each of them to have that jealousy. Well, not good reason, but there's understandable reasons to have that jealousy. I also think neither of them have fully processed the loss of Steve and the Mm -hmm. mess that he left them. We've talked a little bit about this, that that Steve's departure left Bucky alone to fix his life and left Sam alone with the mantle and the shield, which might have made for a neat little cleanup for as far as Steve was concerned, but for neither of them. And I feel like all they see when they look at each other is that Steve isn't here. And I just think that hurts for a couple reasons. Um, you know, not just that he's their best friend, that, but that there's a little bit of abandonment there. Oh, I love that. I love that. And, you know, the openings of, of the show thus far, and I mean, we've only had two episodes, so we only have two examples. So I can't say that this is going to be like a running theme, but it feels like the loss of Steve is so heavy in the show, particularly at the beginning. Like it, it puts the audience in the sense of loss and mourning that I'm sure the two of them are also enduring. Like the first episode, I don't know about you, but I thought... Sam was on his way to a funeral. Yeah, that's what I assumed, you know, the, the, the putting on the suit, grabbing the shield. Right. And then at the beginning of this episode, I'm like, who is in this body bag? Oh, man. You know, with the unzippering and the close up to it and the darkness of it, it literally felt like opening a body bag. And then, of course, we find out that it's a, a clothes bag to protect the Captain America uniform the new captain american uniform and you know it's kind of like the corpse of captain america is in this bag and i'm just like well goddamn, like shit <laughs> like this is some heavy 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 stuff so you know i think we have to mourn you know steve along with these two they're making us do it from the opening seconds of each episode I am blown away by that read on that opening shot of the body bag. You know, I was taking it as this sort of weight of the the zipper, but I I don't think I read that level. And I think you're exactly right that it's resurrecting, but this weird zombie version, it'll never be the same because what you put down in the ground and whatever comes back is not the same. And we get this 
weird zombie cap running around. But the that's a whole level of gravitas I hadn't even processed. I think that's exactly right. And the whole show obviously has this cloud of Steve hanging over it. And they did a pretty good job of bringing that into John Walker's story, too. Yeah, There's just so much here. And you're right about this theme of the something about Steve at the beginning of every episode. Let's keep an eye on that and see if that holds up. Let's talk about Sam now in some detail. In this episode, what resonated most with you about his story? Well, forgive me if I go on. Please do. <laughs> um, the Baltimore scene hit me hard from beginning to end. And it really struck a chord with me for two reasons. First, people seeing Sam's race before they see him. Mm-hmm resonated with me deeply as a black woman of color. When the kid called him Black Falcon and he had to check him, I both laughed and shook my head because he checked him with such grace. And uh, and for another reason, I'll get to in a few minutes, it was a really lovely moment. But at the same time, it's so annoying because... <laughs> First, the moment shouldn't be happening in the first place. The man's damn name is Falcon right. and <laughs> not Black Falcon. And two, you know, like, it's like folks don't see a man. They see a black man. And that hurts me so deeply. And listen, I'm not saying people should be colorblind. Not at all. When you interact with someone and you don't acknowledge to yourself you don't need to say this shit out loud, but you don't acknowledge to yourself that their race plays a factor in their life. You're erasing their identity. Mm -hmm. And if they're a person of color, you're erasing their struggle and the struggle of their ancestors. So don't do that shit. <laughs> you know, but I don't run around calling you white Mark and you don't call me black Christine. Right. right. Like, That's right. We definitely don't do that. <laughs> as far as I know, yeah, you don't no, do that. And I, <laughs> and I don't do that. So calling him Black Falcon feels so inappropriate. But this Black Falcon nonsense also reminds me about the ridiculous false necessity of comic writers identifying the race of Black superheroes in their uh, comic name, right? So like Black Panther, Black Lightning, Black Goliath, Nubia from Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. you know, like it's annoying as hell. And listen, Mark, I don't know, you know, the the litany of super superheroes that are out there. But besides Bucky, is anyone out there who's white have white in their superhero name? Not really. And I got to tell you, even Bucky doesn't because White Wolf is somebody else entirely in the comics. But see, but at least in the MCU... He could be the white wolf, right? He is like... That's true. And it is for the reasons that he he is an adopted brother of T'Challa from Wakanda. So his parents mm -hmm. die in a plane crash or whatever, and he's raised by T'Chaka. And so he's the white wolf for the same reasons, I, I suppose, that Wakanda, you know, we're, Americans are obsessed with putting black in front of black superheroes. The implication there, I guess, is Wakandans put white in front of this one guy. Right. So... And and it's I think the kids who name him the White Wolf too, right? So That's like it's a little it's similar, yeah. yeah, to these kids in the street in Baltimore hollering out Black Falcon. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, the the scene on Isaiah's block is bookended by these issues of of people seeing Sam's race before they see him. You know, it's the kids in the beginning and the cops at the end. Yeah, and. You know, these cops are over policing this economically challenged neighborhood in Baltimore, and they just assume that Sam is harassing Bucky in the street. And there were about eight cops that showed up in mere seconds for two men having a loud discussion in the street, you know, and I was more anxious about that scene than them fighting on the top of two racing Mack trucks. I think that's fighting a great point. Fighting super soldiers. Like, was your heart not racing faster during the this, this scene with the cops? 100%. When the cops roll in and they're just not listening, which is, you know, right. again, that's the whole point of the scene, but it's just definitely stressful as hell. And, you know, I think the writers were smart 
to pick Baltimore. Hmm. Honestly, they could have picked anywhere in America, but Baltimore is really known for its over-policing of black neighborhoods and violence. It was the home of Freddie Gray, who was killed by police officers, who nearly severed his spine during a wrongful arrest. You know, according to the ACLU of Maryland, um, between 2015 and 2019, there were over 13,000 complaints of misconduct filed. They were filed against just over 1,800 Baltimore city police officers. Wow. And nearly 23,000 use of force incidences in Baltimore. Good God. So, but here's the kicker. 91% of those who the police targeted with use of force were black residents. So racism and bias in the Baltimore Police Department is very real. It is not an MCU thing. So the writers were smart to have this scene happen in Baltimore. But the second reason why, you know, Baltimore really hits a chord with me is that representation matters. Mm hmm. You know, those little boys and their dad were hyped on Falcon because he's black. Yeah. There are only two Avengers who are African-American. So, of course, they're going to be excited to see Sam. They live in a world where it's possible for a black kid in America to grow up to be an Avenger. Sam is a pioneer for them, but he didn't have one. That's right. Had Sam known that there had been a black super soldier who took on Hydra in the 50s, just like Steve, Isaiah took up Steve's job. To quote someone else in this show, he did the work. Yeah. Right? Sam might have felt differently about holding on to that shield if he knew about Isaiah. If the world knew about Isaiah Bradley, not just Sam, if the world knew that there had been a black man who took on Cap's role, the Marvel Universe might be a different place. Yeah, and Bucky thinks he's doing the right thing by keeping Isaiah's story to himself because he's like, he's been through enough. But you could see with Sam's shaking of the head after Bucky said that, it's like, it's maybe not your call to make. Right, exactly. You know, and there's a big difference between going to ABC with Isaiah Bradley's story and going to Sam Wilson with Isaiah Mm -hmm. Bradley's story. You know, mm-hmm. Sam wasn't saying you have to tell the world necessarily. You at least could have started by telling him. I right. Feel like. and, or Steve. And Cap. Somebody. Yeah. Somebody. You know, and Cap, because maybe Cap could have been a brother to Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Maybe helped Isaiah heal. I mean, who knows? Who knows? But, you know, telling Isaiah's story is just would have been incredibly important to so many different people. And if people don't know about him, Isaiah can't get the help that he needs. Obviously, he needs to heal. He's been through so much trauma. And the fact that no one even knows about his existence, there's no way he's going to get the help that he needs. Yeah, I have a feeling we're not done with Isaiah's story, nor his grandson, Eli, who has some comics history as well. So keep your eye on the Bradley household for sure you know sam has a big heart in this show and yet everyone constantly seems to work hard to disappoint him and you know i think about how much he tried with bucky we've already talked about a couple of those times and yet at the end of the day bucky can only go so far obviously bucky's keeping the secret of isaiah feels like a massive betrayal Cap and Lamar, John Walker and Lamar, reveal that, you know, Red Wing's being hacked and has been hacked the whole time. So the government, once again, his employer overly surveilling him. I think there's some really interesting implications of that. Mm -hmm. And he keeps trying to give John Walker a chance, only to be slapped in the face by these wingman lines and his tryhard efforts to seize control of the situation because that's what he feels like he needs to do in that uniform. So just really struck me how much Sam kept trying, kept opening opportunities for people to not let him down. And yet people keep letting him down. Yeah. I mean, when he was in the therapist, well, the, it wasn't the therapist's office when he was in the <laughs> in interrogation like a holding room. cell. <laughs> right. Uh, with, with Bucky and the therapist, 
you know, he was like, can't you can't you just like think for a second that I'm doing this for the right reasons? And Bucky doesn't say anything. And it's just like, God damn it, Bucky, like you had a moment where you could have like helped again. So it's like, you know, yeah, poor Sam. He is trying and he's putting himself out there. And yeah, no, I agree with you. Those are all good points. What was Sam's smartest move in this episode? So, be interested to see if you agree with me, but turning down Walker's plea to team up. Hell yeah. I think was a smart move. Okay, good. Because he and Bucky need to stay independent and do things their way. This is Falcon and the Winter Soldier, not Falcon and the Winter Soldier and the new Captain America and Battlestar, right? Right. Or whatever his name is, Galactica. What is is his name? Battlestar. Okay, I might end up calling him Galactica just because. Harsh. Um, <laughs> so obviously they can't trust Walker and Hoskins Mm-mm. because, like you said, they were fucking tracking him via Red Wing. And Walker doesn't know his fucking place. So fuck that guy anyway. And maybe it's petty, but why should they help bolster this guy's image by helping him secure a win? It's a great question. Right. Sam needs a new challenge. His days of being the sidekick are over. He needs to lead or co-lead this mission with Bucky. Walker sucks all the air out of the room. So no, Sam was right to pass on teaming up with him. And he's working for the people who we know we should be wary of because this is the same government that did horrible things to Isaiah Bradley that will pull strings that are hacking Sam's actual gear, which we just learned about. So I think being wary of having to fully answer to the U.S. government on this is wise by Sam. It doesn't work out, but Sam is really smart to try and learn more about what the Flag Smashers are up to. It's Mm -hmm. he's like, you know, Bucky's inclination is to be the smash him up person that we were worried this show was going to be. And Sam's whole thing is. Let's make this a spy show and not a combat show. Yeah. And Bucky doesn't seem to want to listen. And of course, once the word hostage comes out, the whole thing gets blown up. But Sam's instincts are right that there's more to the Flag Smashers than just being terrorists who hold people hostage and steal things. He knows there's a bigger plan out there. Nobody, fucking nobody will let him follow the the threads and just let him do his job. But he's 100% right about that. And I think it will play out that that those instincts will bear out. So I, I don't know that he wins those struggles because other people keep blowing up a spot, but I just think that's really smart by Sam to, to, to try and do that when it comes to the Flag Smashers. No, I agree 100%. I mean, you, you have to know your enemy, right, in order to defeat them. And the fact that we're seeing that there's more and more to the Flag Smashers than just this global unification, you know, propaganda that they're peddling like there is definitely another agenda going on here and i think it's important for sam to figure out what the hell it is but will you indulge me Mm. by letting me add another smart move please do sam did this episode i gotta give him props for letting bucky tag along you know, Le- so what? Well, well, no, wow. did he let him? Because he, sh- I mean, I, mm, yeah. listen, he told Bucky he couldn't come. Right. But if he really didn't want Bucky to come, he could have gotten the government involved. He could have like they could have attempted to stop Bucky from boarding that plane in the U.S. before it went off to Germany. They could have. They could have. But it's smart to incorporate Bucky because. Bucky made the call to visit Isaiah, which led to the lead that Hydra messed with him, mm-hmm. which led to Bucky determining that Zemo is the next person could could help. Right. Walker's trail is cold. Yeah. It is cold. He doesn't know. He doesn't have any leads. Bucky is the only one with ideas since Red Wing was murdered. All I'm going to say is to be continued later in this podcast. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So talk to me about where Sam might have gone a little wrong. Did he make a mistake in this episode? He's the one who isn't the best communicator this time. (laughs) So, you know, we've definitely talked about Bucky needing to communicate more in the past. We definitely talked about that during our preview. Um, But this episode is entitled The Star Spangled Man, which comes from the Captain America song from the 40s. He's the Star Spangled Man. With a plan. (laughs) That's so true. Oh, my God. Right. 
which is the part that is missing from the title. And Steve always had a plan. It was clear and he communicated it to everyone. And if it changed, he called that audible for everyone to hear, right? Sam, on the other hand, is a star-spangled man with a plan, but he doesn't communicate it. Right. He clearly wanted this to be a surveillance mission, but he never said that to Bucky until Bucky kept trying to charge everyone half cocked. That's true. All that time spent having staring contests on the plane or talking shit, he could have spent telling Bucky, you know, we're observing until I give the signal to engage. That's all it takes. That's right. That's all it takes. And I mentioned earlier, you know, when Bucky reveals that he cares about Sam giving up the shield because it says something about Cap potentially making a mistake in believing in Bucky, he doesn't respond to Bucky with compassion. Now, it's not right for Bucky to put his insecurities on Sam, Mm -hmm. but Sam could have handled that moment better. Yeah, that's the moment that stuck out to me because you're right, we should not gloss over the fact that Bucky said a hurtful thing to Sam. But I think the right thing to do in that moment is convey that that was hurtful and why and continue the dialogue. Because he crosses a line at the end, I think, when he says that he hopes that they never see each other again after this mission. Because Bucky is extremely fragile. It's kind of creepy. Everybody knows it. Sam definitely knows it. And Bucky basically just put that on the table again, hurtfully. So it's okay to say, hey, that really hurt. I need a minute here. But he escalated instead. And it's normal. It's human. I get it. But threatening to cut Bucky off right after Bucky yeah. at least said some kind of breakthrough in any couple's therapy, if your response to your partner having a breakthrough, even if they, it comes out hurtfully, the response should not be to shut down. And unfortunately, Sam did. I get it. But I think that was a miss. Yeah, no, 100%. Plus that aggressive, like, pat on the (laughs) arm before he left. I was just like, oh, God. Lady therapist, say something. Help them. Stop this moment. Don't let him run off, please. And then, of course, because it's a show, you know, we got to maintain that tension for a little while. She just lets him go. Oh, God, that scene hurt a lot. We got our second reminder that she's a combat veteran. I still wonder if we're going to see Rainer do something wild. Um, That'd be amazing. Let's talk about the other half of our couple, Bucky, the white wolf, Freaky Magoo. (laughs) What resonated most with you about Bucky in this episode? (sighs) Bucky really broke my heart this episode. Mm. Um, When I see Bucky, I see a man who is trying to escape and make up for a past that really isn't his. You know, he's got the memories and the guilt of being a winter soldier when his mind wasn't his own. Mm -hmm. And it's so unfair that he feels the weight of those actions when he didn't have any control over himself. You know, and he's trying to make amends for that time. But in this episode, his past gets thrown in his face twice, and I hated it. It hurt me Mm -hmm. for him. I know Sam was trying to be funny, but (laughs) when he tried to stop Bucky from going into the Flag Smashers den hot by saying, we're not assassins, it was it was mean. Yeah. You know, again, not really great communication, Sam. Um, And. And then after he tells Isaiah that he's not a killer anymore, Isaiah just dashes everyone's dreams, really, (laughs) by Mm -hmm. saying, you know, you think you can wake up one day and decide who you want to be? It doesn't work like that. Well, maybe it does for folks like you. Yeah. And in that last sentence, he was definitely talking about white people and not Hydra. That's right. Bucky's people might be Hydra, but people like you is white people, let's be clear. But Bucky literally woke up from his Winter Soldier mind scramble and decided to be someone different, to be himself. He's on a path right now trying to determine who he wants to be, you know, what's going to give him the peace that he desires. And, And Sam and Isaiah putting him down in this episode just really hurt my soul. I think there's two words that define where Bucky really is mentally and emotionally in this episode, and that is on tilt. 
Bucky is on mm-hmm. tilt in this episode. We open with him watching that John Walker press conference. And I think from that moment on, he's never able to keep control of his emotions and his anger and his frustration. Mm-hmm. That culminates most obviously when he says to Sam, let's take the shield and go get these guys ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You do not actually need the shield to do that. Other weapons are very effective as well. Taking the shield is not a sensible part of the plan. But when something gets under your skin and you know you should move on from it, but you can't, you can start dreaming up these unworkable scenarios, some of yeah. which might be criminal to deal with. And I, <laughs> I, you know, it's like, that's not great. But it, so if somebody takes something from you that you feel like you deserve, if somebody else lets you down in a way that you're having trouble communicating, any of those kinds of things, it can leave you in a place where it's just hard to get back to center. And he feels like there's this unfair situation unfolding. His inability to control it is driving him up a wall and yeah i just think he's on tilt and i really resonated with that and i don't think he's going to be fully back off tilt i guess re-tilted laying straight i don't know what the opposite of on tilt is um grounded oh god there you go grounded i don't think he's gonna be grounded (laughs) until this is all over um and even then we're talking about degrees because it's bucky but anyway i just thought he was on tilt it really resonated with me uh yeah, he was definitely on an emotional roller coaster from the very beginning of the episode with that, you know, Good Morning America interview, just the, the range of emotions that you saw on his face. And again, we got to give props to Sebastian Stan for being an amazing nonverbal actor. I mean, he's a great verbal actor, too, but his facial expressions and body language. I mean, I had to take a picture of him leaning against the police you know, da- table or whatever when he was waiting for his session to begin because it was such a mood. He was just so frustrated and pissed. But like the the, the he went from disbelief to anger to I want to rage on these people to like I'm, you know, I'm I'm running away from being an assassin. That's not me anymore to, oh, buddy, like you think you get to pick who you are like you're still an assassin and then hurting his his teammates feelings and feeling bad about that but also feeling bad about the fact that like you know his emotions are tied up in what his teammate is doing and what he has done with this shield and this abandonment that he feels from steve it's just oh god it's just a lot it's a lot it's a lot so so you gotta you gotta have some sense of understanding for where Bucky is right now because he's just, he's all over the place and he's not grounded. This is why he needs someone to center him and to remind him of who James Buchanan Barnes is. Well, you know, Sharon Carter's uh, into inappropriate relationships, so maybe she'll dive in (laughs) with Steve's best friend. Why not? That maybe gets... Gets this whole thing going. I'm just kidding. I don't really think that. Sharon slander. I love it. No, look, hey, I, I'm still waiting for some Sharon uh, redemption in this in this miniseries. So we'll. Well, get she got her. name checked, so hopefully she's coming up soon. I, I'm guessing the Zemo episode is going to get us some Sharon time too. We'll see, though. Bucky wasn't all bad in this episode, though. What was a smart move that Bucky made for you? So again, his breakthrough during therapy was pretty great, right? Not bad. So. You know, you've mentioned in the past that he's not a great communicator, and that might still be true. <laughs> um, his delivery wasn't the best, but he was open to his feelings. You know, like I said, Bucky is isolated. He's alone. He's suffering. His brother, the one person who believed in him, even when he was under mind control, is off the grid, could be on the fucking moon for all we know. That's right. Um, he doesn't have the support system there to say, yes, Buck, you know, I believe in you. I believe there's a good guy in there. James Buchanan Barnes is a guy who is with you to the end of the line, who will offer you a place to stay when your life is turned upside down, who will fight alongside you, even if that means plummeting to his death. That's right. You know, Steve was critical to Bucky's recovery. And I think if he kept this information inside... That if C was wrong to trust Sam with his legacy, then maybe he's wrong for believing in Bucky. Then it would have just eaten away from him from the inside. 
And I think the fact that Bucky feels awful at the end of that session is a sign that you're right, that he actually had a breakthrough. Whereas Sam put up the walls and was like, whatever, I don't care. Bucky feels awful because he confronted something he probably never even said to himself. Right, right. And the fact that he could say it to Sam out loud, you know, it's not like he was looking in a mirror and was like, I feel awful. You know, he said it to Sam. He's he's opening up. And again, it's it's like the conversations he should have had a while ago or, or, you know, like how him offering Steve a place to stay after Steve lost his entire family is the speech that Hawkeye should have given Wanda, you know, this I feel awful speech is the speech he should have given Tony yeah, during Civil War. So it's not too little too late, but at least Bucky is learning and growing and and learning to have the conversations that he should have had a while ago. Yeah, I like the fact that he forced his way into that mission with Sam. So I read Mm -hmm. that as obviously right. Technically, Sam could have kicked him out, but he was pushing back pretty hard. And it reminded me a lot of how Bucky approached Yori last episode. Mm -hmm. Yori was like, get off. I don't want to. I quit. I don't want to go to lunch. And Bucky's like, no, we're doing this thing. And it was a nice repeat of that behavior from Bucky to step forward when he does recognize somebody is in need. I do think he knows that Sam is hurting from this new cap. However much he might say he blames Sam for that, no mm-hmm. question he can see that, that that is really hurtful to Sam. And this is his semi-dysfunctional way of being there for his buddy because obviously they are bad at emotional intimacy and expressing that in a, in a mature language around that. But he puts himself in that situation with Sam because I think he's worried Sam is on tilt and wants to look out for him. So Mm -hmm. I thought that was a pretty smart move by Bucky. And it wasn't a choice out of nowhere because we got what we got last episode with Yori. Bucky, I I wonder if if some of the reason why, you know, I love Bucky so much is because I see a little bit of myself in Bucky in Mm. that, you know, I'm always trying to support everyone else because I need support. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, that's my way of asking for it. Like, I'm going to show up for you the way I need you to show up for me. Mm-hmm. Maybe. But like, just like Bucky, I'm a little too proud to ask for help. Now, this is something I've been working on for years and I've become much better about just asking for help instead of being mad when people don't show up for me like I expect them to because everyone is supposed to read my mind. But... Bucky is not going to let one of his friends go into a fight alone. That's right. And and maybe I'm now answering the very first question you posed. Mm. They I think they are friends. They must be because or they're more than friends, they're family because you know they sh- he is showing up for Sam whether Sam likes it or not. I think that's a great point. Yeah. So where did Bucky go wrong? What was his misstep this episode? I mean, I think Bucky's almost damn perfect. Mm. So this is always going to be difficult for me. But, you know, I'm just going to state the obvious and say missing his required therapy session is not good, but not for the obvious reason of it landed him in jail and maybe, you know, uh, puts his pardon into a little bit of jeopardy. But... He owes Walker a favor now. Like, that's the thing that upsets me the most about this, because Walker is the one who took care of getting Bucky out. Right. And I don't want Bucky to owe Walker anything. Hell no. That's a terrible idea. Not that he knew that this would lead to Walker, you know, getting him out and him owing Walker a favor. But who knows? Maybe maybe Bucky doesn't even believe in that. It's like, hey... You wanted me out because you wanted to use me. So whatever. I'm just going to take the fact that I'm free now and run with it. But I still have this like, oh, this nagging thing at the back of my mind where it's like he did this favor for Bucky. Therefore, Bucky owes him a favor. And it just, ugh. Yeah, being in debt to people you don't want to be in debt to is a bad thought. And I do think there's a way where you don't read Bucky forcing his way into Sam's mission totally altruistically because we know he was kind of mad at Dr. Rayner last episode. Did he do this partly to dodge that therapy appointment consciously or subconsciously? I don't know. Maybe. 
Yeah. I don't know. It's a complicated question. No easy answers. I'm tempted to say that not letting Sam track the semi-trucks was his biggest mistake. Though all he would have found out is that they were going to this German internet cafe, I guess, to hang out for an mm-hmm. overnight session. So I don't think breaking up that guy's little enterprise would have led them as far as Sam had hoped. So what I kind of thought he messed up on a little bit was underestimating Carly the first time he laid eyes on her. Now, I want to be clear, there's some very understandable reasons for that. Sam had implied it was a hostage already, so he right. had that in his mind. Uh, there was a person riding in a truck uh, who looked like maybe they were being restrained or held, but not really. She was just kind of sitting there in the x-ray. I feel like if he had walked up on a guy, even a scrawny guy, he would have asked more questions and been more wary. He would have checked, mm-hmm. are you a hostage? But instead, he sees her. She's small. She's slight. She's a girl. Uh, and I think, you know, sexism and ageism can pop up in some surprising ways for all of us. And I can't say I wouldn't have made the same mistake, but it really sucked for him that he underestimated Carly. And, you know, again, he could have he could have been hurt even worse than he was uh, by doing so. So I thought that was kind of a mistake for Bucky. Yeah. But look, enough about our favorite heroes. It's time to talk about our least favorite hero, Mm. John Walker. Oh, so we're calling him a hero now? I mean, he did some good things in this episode, but clearly we should start with this question based on that reaction. Christine, what sucks most about John Walker? His fucking face. Mm. Fuck the flags. I want to smash his fucking face. No, no, no. I, I mean, yes, but that's not my response. That's not my real answer for this. But yes, his fucking face is awful. I want to punch him in the fucking... Anyway... My biggest gripe, and there are many, but my biggest gripe with John Walker is that he wants to be the hero. He relishes it. He thinks he's, quote, done the work to become Captain America. But the path of the hero is always a reluctant one. Those who go seeking glory and power and fame don't have the best intentions. And I have the fucking receipts, okay? He didn't meet Sam in the U.S. and fly over with him. He didn't meet Sam and Bucky at the airport in Germany. There was no let's get together and plan this out as a group. He waited until Red Wing went offline and they couldn't track Sam anymore and swooped in in order to say they saved the day. Mm. He doesn't want to co-lead things with Sam. He wants Sam and Bucky to be his backup dancers. No, sir. These are Avengers. Veteran Avengers. Show them some goddamn respect. Stop calling them Sam and Bucky. Oh, Mm. especially Bucky. Mm. I want to choke him every time he fucking says Bucky's name. They are Wilson and Barnes to you. Read the fucking room who has the caucasity to walk up to (laughs) sam wilson and introduce themselves as john walker captain america read the fucking room yeah i might have had a rant on my heart yeah not a great look bucky the way he's like bucky it's like through his nose bucky oh it's tough (sighs) it's tough Oh, every time he says Bucky, I'm fucking triggered. Like, I, oh, this fucking douchebag. He drives me crazy. He's too fucking familiar with them. They are not Sam and Bucky to you. Do not invoke the name of Tony Stark and Dr. Banner like you're a fucking Avenger just because they gave you the fucking shield. You are not an Avenger, sir. Yeah. You are not. You are not on the same level with these fucking people. Oh, the caucasity. It drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. I think John Walker's suckiness is really summed up in three different lines throughout the episode. The first one was, even though I never met him, he feels like a brother. Oh, like God. Saying that about Steve Rogers is cynical as fuck, right? To be clear, he doesn't actually feel that way. That's a PR line that somebody probably wrote for him. And the fact that he was willing to say it and to try to sell it reveals that he has a deep level of ambition. It's a naked ambition that Mm -hmm. should scare us Mm -hmm. about him. 
The second line that bothers me was, that was a bad idea. When he hops back up on the semi to right. a super soldier, Carly Morgenthau, right. who then immediately just knocks his ass off the semi as an afterthought. That being that cocky when he knew he was up against super soldiers by that point, based on how he should have been able to read the rest of the combat, su suggests that he's going to get in over his head and make some big mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then the third line for me was obviously the, it'd be a whole lot easier if I had Cap's wingman at my side. Just the disrespect and the ego Ugh. of that line is hurtful. Because that's all Sam is. That's right. all Sam and Bucky's value is. They are props for this man's ego. Yeah. I, I've rewatched this episode a few times. And even though I basically know these lines by heart now, I still yell at my television every time he fucking says them. Because it's just so incredibly disrespectful of the work that these men have put in. Mm -hmm. to saving the planet and the whole universe <laughs> time and time again that you think that you could just jump in and be at the same level as them. But not only that, take it one step further and tell them they need to support you and not the other way around. And this job is a pressure cooker. And that's what one of the things from that opening scene that I think we're meant to take away from this. He's doing this. He's overreaching. He's using those first names in part because he feels like he has to because that's what this job requires. And the more he's in these spots and the more he's coming up short and the more he's not a super soldier, the closer he's going to come to cracking, in my opinion. It's going to be bad. I agree. Could be real bad. But I don't necessarily think it's all bad. And I'm curious if you do, too. Do you see any redeeming qualities in Mr. John Walker? So, one, he knows how to fucking use that shield. I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't take that away from him. You know, um, Battlestar Galactica, you know, he literally saved his ass by tossing that shield under him and, and all of that. Although he was tossing it at the top of that shield with some... A little bit of reckless abandon. Bucky had to dodge that thing twice. I did not miss that. True. Okay, Mr. fucking Captain America. I, I saw that. He went for Bucky's neck twice. But, you know, like you said, he is under pressure and I can appreciate that, you know? And I'll even go so far as to say I can identify with him being upset when Bucky called it out. Walker was triggered when Bucky was like <laughs> things are really intense for you aren't they Walker mm -hmm. this man does not want a soul to know that he's sweating in that suit That's a great and you movie. know as a recovering perfectionist I get that but he's still a fucking douche well you know in the big picture I do think they're trying to convey to us that his heart is in the right place even Torres who I think we're supposed to like and trust says he seems like a good guy um uh, I think Olivia, his wife, and his relationship with Lamar speak well of him in a lot of respects. I think you could make a case that you could flip this story and I could tell you a narrative that would sound like this guy's a hero. So imagine, Christine, if I pitch you a show about an MIT trained hostage rescue expert with three medals of honor, a great wife and best friend who is trying to do an impossible thing and step into the biggest shoes on the planet. And every time he tries, anybody who had any chance to actually help him make that leap just instead acts like a dick and gets in his way and brushes him off. I think, I think that you can tell a story about how there's a protagonist in there somewhere. Yes. <laughs> I mean, from a... That's my best effort a, anyway. Yeah, no, and, and I think it's a good one. I mean, but from a certain perspective, from a certain point of view, mm. you know, anyone could sound like a hero or sound like someone that we can identify with, sympathize for, and all of that. So... You know, that outline is all well and good, but what it's missing is all of the context it sure is, <laughs> around yeah. it, right? right? Like all of the history of the shoes that he's trying to fill and then the attitude with which 
he is presenting himself in taking on that role. So I definitely applaud your effort. I did my best. And and I will, you know, continue to try placing myself in John Walker's shoes. But there is, there's just something about a guy who gets too familiar too quickly that really fucking bothers me. It has always bothered me. Now, I can think of one person who has surmounted that. And that is one of my dearest friend's wife. She came in hot. She came in acting (laughs) like she was everybody's friend and like inserted herself into the big group like right away. And I was just like, who is this heifer? Like, who is she? Now, I love I love this woman to death. Hmm. But like she's the one person who's been able (laughs) to like overcome that type of that type of first impression and just like good luck to walker because he does not seem to be like i said reading the room and figuring out that this overly aggressive i'm at the same level as you let's be friends let's be teammates you know i'm really trying here come be my backup dancer oh just it just rubs me the wrong way Yeah, there's no way this isn't going to take a dark turn. It will not end well for John Walker. But I And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting (laughs) to see. But I do keep coming back to the relationships that they open with. We didn't get enough time with Olivia, but what do you make of his relationship with Lamar, a.k.a. Battlestar Galactica? I think it's genuine, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So I, I have no worries about their relationship. What I'm suspicious about is the fact that DOD has paired them together. That is suspect to me because clearly the two of them are part of a team that previously existed before Cap Shield became an option, Mm -hmm. right? They've trained together. They've been part of a team. They've done operations together. Their relationship is genuine. Mm Mm-hmm. But because they were part of a team, I'm sure that there were other options for who this new Captain America's sidekick was going to be, whose partner was going to be. So the fact that DOD chose Hoskins over whoever else might be on the team, I think is suspicious. So him having this black partner, I think, is also a PR choice on their part. I'm very suspicious about it. I think that's a good thing to be wary of. My read was that these guys do go way back, potentially also to high school. It seemed like he and Olivia's familiarity, Lamar's, I mean, a signal that maybe the three of them all did know each other in high school, presumably in Georgia, where it seems like he played this high school football. Um, So I do think it suggests that Walker can engender some loyalty and that Lamar can as well, that these two have probably seen some shit together. I also Mm -hmm. think, based on that opening scene, they might be better at emotional communication than Sam and Bucky at this point. That's a low bar. But I do think they seem to be at least getting real with each other about the gravity of the situation more so than Sam and Bucky. And I think that just speaks to the fact that they probably have known each other a while. That doesn't necessarily mean that the government didn't pounce on this as opportunists to try to reflect some sort of overly two-dimensionally flat kind of version of Cap and Sam, but... You know, I took it that they have a long relationship before, during, and after combat. Yeah, no, 100%. You know, I think visually they're meant to invoke Steve and Sam. But when you see their relationship dynamic, it's far more Steve and Bucky. Yeah. Well, I'm hopeful for Lamar. Battlestar is actually a pretty cool character in the comics. He actually fights John Walker in the comics when John Walker isn't doing good stuff. And as we talked about on StoryCast... He, shake, he is actually a, an original Bucky. He was briefly had that moniker. Uh, and then he was like, this is super fucked up and racist because of the word Buck and shakes that off and chooses the name Battlestar for that. So, you know, I'm hopeful that Lamar, even if John Walker is unsalvageable, that there's a lot to work with in terms of keeping Lamar part of the MCU in some form or fashion. We'll see. Sounds good. I'm less excited about the prospects of keeping the Flag Smashers around for a long time. But in this series, there's no question that they are getting more and more screen time. 
as their plots and plans emerge. I'm very concerned about what Carly meant when she said, after tomorrow, everything will be different. Mm -hmm. That doesn't Mm -hmm. sound like the kind of thing a good person will say usually, but I could be wrong. Christine, are the Flag Smashers bad guys? Like, definitely. Listen, if we're talking about that line in particular, it sounds an awful lot like, tomorrow we launch. You know what I mean? (laughs) Miss you, Uh, Just to Just to bring a little WandaVision back for you. Um, But, you know, the first time I saw this episode, I'm like, "Uh, they're not that bad. You know, everybody thinks they're Robin Hood. But then I realized I haven't seen them redistribute anything. You know? Plus, (laughs) Hopkins... Hopkins said that they attack global repatriation council camps for their resources, which then they distribute to people who survived the blip. So this isn't stealing from the rich to give to the poor. This is stealing from the displaced to give to the poor. So not great. Yeah, they stole vaccines from people who have no housing to do whatever the fuck they're going to do with it. So that's my thing. Like, did they steal vaccines? Are those just vaccine cases? Maybe did they steal vaccines? They actually distributed those vaccines. But then what's in that truck isn't actually vaccines. Like I, there's a lot, I feel like there's a, there's a lot going on here that is being shown, but not being said, right? So because when Sam and Bucky meet up with them outside of Munich, that was no GRC camp, right? Right. And neither was that Swiss bank. So Clearly, they have another agenda here. I have a guess as to what it might be, but I think we need at least another episode to really find out what's going on here with the Flag Smashers. And thus far, like, we've had a bad guy introduced, but it's like they're not the big bad. No, we we know she got a text message from somebody even worse. Exactly, exactly. So I'm like, oh, if if these super soldiers are scared of this power broker who they name checked, then, I mean, they've got to be in the running for the big bad then. Absolutely. And you should tune into Ponder Vision to hear more about the power broker. We're definitely going to get into that. I do every week. It's my favorite podcast. No, it's going to be good. We're going to get into that character because I think there's some stuff there. But what about Carly herself, right? What's your impression of her so far? And what do you think is going to happen to her? My impression is that she can't act her way out of a paper bag. Oh, no. Really? But, <laughs> yeah, I don't think she's that great of an actress. Oh, I like And maybe her. it's just like residual emphasis nest, you know, annoyance with the way she was like revealed in Solo with all this big fanfare. And you're like, but who the fuck is she? Hmm. That's beside the point. You know, I think the the power broker who she stole from Sounds like really bad news. Um, She definitely took something of value from the power broker. And I'm assuming it's what's in those vaccine boxes in the truck. Right. Maybe. So um, it's got to be something valuable enough for him to be like, yo, I will end you, Miss Super Soldier. Well, what do you think is the most valuable thing the Flag Smashers have? I think it's got to be serum. It's got to be super soldier serum. Right. So what's already in their blood? That's what I think, right? Like, I don't, I think those vaccines have a purpose. I don't know how much people want to be spoiled by stuff that's in the comics around what happens when the power broker is involved with super soldiers. But let's just say there might be some need for that. They took super soldier serum. I don't think it's what's in the cases. There's not enough of that. If there was that much super soldier serum in the world, well, maybe there will be. Then we're in real fucking trouble because then you can have like That's a million what strong I'm army. Saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be terrifying. One world, one people. <gasps> like I everybody's a super? Because when everyone's a super, no, no one's one is. a super. Yeah. That's, mm, yeah. Mm, interesting. You know what this is? It's the plot to The Incredibles 2. <laughs> so, wait. So, you think maybe their plan is make everybody a super soldier, like put it in the yes. water or something, make a bunch of people super. And yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I will be intrigued if that's where they go, uh, because that would be very powerful and would suggest that maybe this global relocation council or whatever has more weird shit going on if they're trying to pretend like things are vaccines when really they're toting around super soldier serum and using it to their own end. So that's terrifying. You know, I think Carly is a true believer in her cause. 
And that's always dangerous when somebody is that dedicated. Mm -hmm. I do think she's a little reckless. Clearly, whoever she stole, whatever she stole from, she didn't cl she didn't cover her tracks well enough to make that super clean. And she may have bitten off more than she could chew. But I also think if her heart is in the right place, in other words, even though I think she's extremely mistaken about how she's looking at blipped people and it's a very anti-refugee position that I'm, I'm impressed at the originality of the Marvel Universe approaching blipped people that way. But, you know, obviously it's super wrong for Carly, I think, to take out her anger and frustration on people who had no choice to be blipped, come back to a right. completely different world. But I think if her heart is in the right place, I think she has a real chance to grow past this and be somebody, again, maybe some kind of anti-hero more than a straight up villain. Yeah. No, I, I would be excited for a path like that for her. Do you got any questions for me, Christine? Yeah, buddy. Um, what do you think Walker's MIT aptitude tests are about? It sounds like some Aryan master race bullshit to me, but he was able to last just as long as Bucky and Sam against those super soldiers. So what the fuck is going on there? So are you asking basically, do you do I think there's some chance that he did get some kind of super program, even if it's just like a very modest one and doesn't realize it? I might be asking a leading question. Yeah, I think no, I think that's a really interesting idea that maybe he actually has been juiced in some way, even if it's not a watered down version. A terrifying thought to me in terms of just the human rights implications is just that he actually has some of Isaiah Bradley's blood in his system and just enough to be a little mm -hmm. bit better and a little more reactive maybe when that shield is bouncing around and able to make those calculations or you know have the reaction time necessary to catch that shield so i don't know that it would i think it would be very powerful if they made a connection directly between john walker and isaiah bradley even if walker isn't fully aware of the context of that so yeah i think it's pretty possible i will say this he clearly is not very powerful and I think if he's presented with the opportunity to inject himself with something that does make him more powerful, even from a questionable source, he might take it. He seems the type. He's that ambitious. Yeah. I mean, and again, he seems to be the struggling perfectionist, right? Who wants to do the job and do the job well and not let anyone down. That's right. Um, so I could totally see him like trying to cut a corner, get all of the help he can. So, yeah, if there's like some black market super soldier serum out there, especially knowing that that's who he's up against right now, he's going to want to take it. Yeah. What if the power broker offers him a deal? Ooh, but in exchange for what? Like he's the one who goes and gets the flag smashers and, and whatever contents they stole from the power broker in exchange for. Ooh. Like make the flag smashers the fall guys for whatever the power broker is doing. We just talked about how we didn't like the idea that Bucky was kind of in Walker's debt. Walker being in the power broker's debt would be a whole other level <sighs> of fucked up. Yeah, no kidding. Especially since he's the face of America. Ugh. Although, you know, I will say there's an interesting detail with him. We talked about the pressure of Steve's shoes to be filled. You know, he is Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn's kid. And I will say, it's interesting to think about your dad being Kurt Russell and then going into fucking acting, going into an action movie career as he's about to do here, clearly. So yeah, Wyatt Russell is the kid of Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. So he has actually had to step into some big shoes. And I do suspect he might be channeling a little of that personal energy here. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he still ended up with that unfortunate face that I want to punch. Yeah, I have a feeling if you saw him in person, you might be like... Hello. I don't know. I don't know. The whole lower half of his face is just not doing it for me at all. And the fact that that's what the mask highlights. It's true. Like, that ah! is that is the mask version of him is a real tough look. But all I'm saying is I suspect the camera just, you know, might not be. I don't know. You're right. He's got two hot parents. They don't always produce a hot kid. I, who am I to judge? Uh, if that's you know. <laughs> I am here to judge. <laughs> no, no, so tell me more. You got any, any others for me? Yeah, I have one more question for you. So Isaiah Bradley wasn't on the screen for very long, but I think he had a lot of impact, right? So what do you think was his biggest contribution to the episode? Man, there's so many things there. I think the biggest overall contribution is the same effect that Isaiah Bradley had in the comics, which is forcing people who engage with that story 
to rethink the entirety, not just of the history of Captain America, but of the the MCU and America, right? Like he, yes. when you process what he's saying, that I was a super soldier, I was out there making a huge difference in Korea. I defeated the Winter Soldier by myself, which almost mm-hmm. nobody else we've ever seen was able to do. Right. And then I was put in jail for 30 years and they treated me like a guinea pig and stole my blood. First of all, hopefully that will encourage people to look into something. We talked on the Storycast about the Tuskegee study a little bit. People should look that up and learn more about it. But I do think his main contribution was at, at the highest level was forcing fans to reckon with the fact that the MCU isn't some kind of fairy tale. You know, Alyssa Rosenberg had a piece in the Washington Post this week about how, you know, Marvel is just this fairy tale land and and everyone needs Zack Snyder stories more. And we don't have to get into what's wrong with Zack Snyder's movies or if you love them, that's great. I have no, I'm not here to talk about the DC universe. What I will say is, I think it's incredibly reductive to say that the MCU is a fairy tale universe. And I think Isaiah Bradley is here to challenge that notion for us Mm -hmm. all. And I look forward to more. It's perfect casting. Carl Lumbly was just, I mean, that's like an award-winning speech, you know, just everything about it blew me away. I don't know. What what, yeah. what do you think was the takeaway? Because, I mean, the other thing is obviously there's a bunch of plot implications and all that, whatever. But um, what did you take away? I mean, it, to me, he brought history to life because... I think it's important that people know the real history of Black contributions, particularly when there's no consent involved. Mm -hmm. Like Isaiah Bradley's story of being locked up for 30 years and being a guinea pig for the U.S. military is not a fantastical story. Like it happened, you know, like. You did mention the the Tuskegee um, syphilis experiments, um, and those lasted for 40 years with Black men in the South who were studied for what would happen should they contract syphilis, but they were left untreated so that basically it was studying how syphilis kills people. And they were left untreated, even after penicillin was discovered to cure syphilis. That's right. Um, And it was absolutely terrible. But it's not even an isolated event. The U.S. military tested the effects of mustard gas on black soldiers, Japanese-American soldiers, and Puerto Rican soldiers during World War II. The even more vile thing about it was... White enlisted men were used as scientific control groups. Right. So their reactions were used to establish what was, quote, normal. normal. Yeah. And then compared to the troops of color. So black and Puerto Rican troops were tested in search of an ideal chemical soldier. And if they were more resistant, they could be used on the front lines while white soldiers stayed back, protected from the gas. Like, this is what the U.S. military did, folks. This is not shit that Marvel made up. (laughs) Nope. This is real. This is based on real life. So bringing a cold sense of reality, of historical reality, I think was a big contribution because I don't think a lot of people know about Tuskegee. Mm -mm. I don't think a lot of people know about the mustard gas testing. People's Black people's DNA have been stolen to create vaccines and drugs and they're not compensated for it i mean this is a this is a long history that we have of exploiting black bodies for nationalistic gain that's right and and i'm so grateful that this tv show is forcing people to confront it if they choose to look a little bit more into the stories. You know, if if you're like us and you're you're listening to podcasts and 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 going on YouTube and 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 reading blogs and whatnot and trying to dive more into the story and listening to the interviews of the um the showrunners. But it's an incredibly important contribution because like the existence of Isaiah Bradley, folks just don't know. 
about a lot of the forced contributions that people of color have made in America. Yeah. If Isaiah Bradley's introduction generates 1,000 or 10,000 conversations or 100,000 conversations about what in real history is connected to his story and his experience, this show will have done a hell of a lot more than a lot of other things to open some people's eyes, white folks especially, uh, to the messy and terrible, mis- you know, not mistakes, crimes of the U.S. government. Yeah. And sorry, folks, but I don't see D.C. doing that. <laughs> and yeah. All right. Christine, I think the most important question left is where can people find and follow you? People can find and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kippens K. And you could also listen to bi-weekly shenanigans with me and my friend Jocelyn on the I'm a Need More Wine podcast. All right, podcast powerhouses. That is our show for today. Again, check out our StoryCast and look out for PonderVision on Wednesday. And if you are enjoying this show, please tell a friend. We need to grab folks who are willing to have smart conversations about the MCU wherever we can find them. And it would mean a lot to us if you could connect us with a few more of them when you've got a chance. So leave us a five-star Apple review with your thoughts or questions. And until next week, let's go steal that shield. I'm in. Let's do it.